thank you all for joining us for this re-recording uh, of the original webinar uh, that we had done. Um, the, the subject today is uh, really spending time with editors and finding out the sort of press perspective on progress, we called it, uh, because when we talk about uh, the progress of the industry, sort of the state of it, where we are, there's nobody who has more exposure to that than the press. Uh, they're, they live at 30,000 feet, their objective viewpoint is something that we count on, uh, but a lot of times we don't really get to hear what they're thinking, what they're exposed to, and how difficult that position can be from time to time. So we thought it was a great opportunity to get in their heads a little bit uh, and uh, sort of find out some of the, some of the things that uh, maybe they don't get to say in the editorials or in their everyday work. So um, I'm going to take you through the panel. Uh, first, if I can ask you people to please introduce yourselves. Peter Giannetti, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Peter Gianetti, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Homeworld Business and Gourmet Insider. Thanks, Tom. I look forward to this. Same here. Warren? And I'm Warren Schulberg. I've been reporting on the home furnishings uh, industry for uh, longer than I care to admit. And uh, right now, I'm writing for a number of publications, uh, Forbes.com, Business of Home, Robin Report, and HFN. Wonderful. Thank you. Allison? And I'm Allison Zisco, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HFN. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, so I, I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, first off, right now, you know, I mean, one of the main reasons that we had this was we're trying to figure out how the industry plans on dealing with the, the consumer's sense of insecurity or how they plan on giving them back some security and get the and the industry and how they're dealing with the insecurities that are associated with this, the pandemic and what it's done to business. Um, but I think one of the first questions is if we look to the consumer and we say home has assumed so many different identities over time. I mean, it's been a cocoon. It's been a creative hub. It's been um, uh, a, uh, the hub of small business. It's been a, you know, a show place and a, uh, an entertaining spot. You know, it's gone from, it's lived through sort of grow your own, make your own, sell your own. What's the next home? What, what do we see coming? Um, Allison, you want to take this one first? Like, what is the next reality? What's our next home going to be? Um, it's a little hard to predict, I'd say. I think, you know, we're all going through a unique experience and unique shared experience. Um, and I don't think anyone really knows how things, some things will be forever changed. Some things will perhaps go back to the way they were. I think we had spoken earlier about some people's habits, about eating at home and spending time with family, you know, those types yeah. of behaviors, you know, from a personal standpoint, I'd like to see continue. That would be good for the industry, frankly. Um, but uh, we were also seeing increased use of certain um, categories, particularly in housewares and in home office products. But um, beyond this, so you, um, you not feel sure. like the home is pretty much going to continue on the road that it's been on, um, you know, in terms of being a uh, <clears throat> sort of, you know, the, the family hub, maybe a little bit more amplified in that way? Again, I think certain things will, yeah, they think the family hub will hopefully stay the same, stay as important as it is right now. Right. Um, okay. Other things, I think, will evolve and change. Some things will go back. Some of the habits that we've adopted will stay put and others, you know, may revert back to what we, where we were before the pandemic. Okay. And um, Peter, thoughts on that? Yeah. I, I, all, the home has been all the things you described. It is a split personality, if you will, uh, in that regard. I think right now the home is a fortress uh, and it's, it's a, the instinct and the tone is about protection. Uh, uh, that's not to say that's what it has become. All the behavior we've seen during, at the front end of the pandemic, as people were buying things, and, and during the pandemic, there was this need to uh, kind of protect yourself and think about how to protect yourself. Now, in, in that is the need to cook more or the need to set up a home office and all those things. I, I think there will be a shift at some point, and I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't think anybody does. Uh, as Allison said, it's, it's very hard and very difficult to predict but it'll shift toward being what I call an oasis. Now, inside an oasis are things similar to, you know, there are protection, it's, it's a refuge, it's a retreat, but the tone changes from one of focused on protection or survival, if you will, to one of enjoying your life. Uh, and and th that's the motivation. It will inherit 
some of the same characteristics of your fortress, but again, right. the tenor changes. Yeah, I, I, I think that, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think it's interesting, you know, it's, it seems to me that over the past few years, again, so many, you look at what's happened over the past few years and so much of it has kind of created an environment that's let us live a lot better from, you know, than we might have here. I mean, I think in the, over the past few years, we've been just not been able to control the external environment. So when you look at category sales, we're seeing a lot of control the environment you're in. I can't control out there, but in terms of internal security systems, in terms of, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> humidifiers, uh, you know, ionizers, all these things that control our internal environment, nest, you know, tech, uh, a lot of, a lot of new technologies have been really sort of taken us to a place where we're used to thinking about these four walls because this we can at least control as much as we can. And I think it's put us in a better place for today. Um, Warren, you have any thoughts on that? Um, where we're gonna be? We're going? I can't wait to get out of my house. I am, I am, uh, <laughs> I've got serious cabin fever here. So, uh, uh, okay. and I think, I, I think I'm being silly, but I think you will see some of that. You'll see a, a surge of people trying to get out and do stuff. You know, the question is this social distancing is not gonna go away and, um, people's comfort levels in restaurants and in sporting events and concerts and, and churches, I, I think is gonna, is gonna be uh, 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 seminally changed. And um, I'm not sure to Peter's point where that settles in, you know, no. whether that's a gradual slide back to, to where we were, but I, but I think certainly for the short term, and I'm saying for a year, I, I think people are going to be very hesitant about socializing, and are going to uh, are going to value their homes more often now. What um, that you, you left out yeah, shopping yeah. malls, Warren, and I think uh, that's another and shopping area that, yeah, this yeah. Is, that's that's yeah. very true. It seems like it's going to be a sliding scale. You know, it's like the it's going to how long we stay in a certain way is going to depend on how long we have to be in this way. You know, so it's, uh, it really does depend on when we hit the apex. Um, yep. So let me ask you, let's start with you Al, on this one, Allison. What habits would you say uh, you've adopted or you've seen people adopt that you think are probably going to stick with us for a while? I mean, back in 2008, when we had the financial crisis, uh, you know, we went back to uh, clipping, well, clipping virtual coupons or, or things like that. And we got, uh, you know, even once we were past, uh, although it was a very stat slow recovery, if you want to call it that, once we got past that, we still kept those habits of, you know, of uh, being more financially savvy, more comparison shopping, things like that. Are there any things that, any habits that have evolved in the American household, in your household that you feel like, you know, we're, we're probably going to stick with this for a while after, you know, after COVID-19 has passed? Well, I think when you look at the different um, retail segments and how they're there and anticipate how those segments are going to recover, it really depends on the retailer. And I was speaking with um, retail analysts yesterday and some are going to be virtually untouched and others are going to be drastically altered. But the one segment that sticking in my head right now is the off price segment that has been strong leading into the, you know, leading into this time. Um, right now, a lot of those of those uh, players in that field don't have strong e-commerce business, but yet analysts predict that they will come out of this strong, that they will, the TJ Maxx's and the Ross's of the world will um, be on solid footing. Some of the other segments are, you know, a little more challenged, particularly the department store, ch this department store channel. So in terms of retail, I think that's uh, some of the future prediction. Makes sense. Um, so, Warren, what about personal habits? What about things that Americans are doing or not doing? Uh, cooking more at home, or you know, even if it's enforced right now, you know, it's like I have to be nice. I have to be. <laughs> I have to like behave myself around the house and try to cook when I can and participate and all those lovely things. But what are the what are the things that the habits we're picking up? Do you think we're going to stick with for a while? And we've all been we've all been saying it. I, I think the percentage of meals that are cooked at home and eaten at home are absolutely going to increase. And and even if we're still doing takeout, those are meals going to be eat, eaten eaten at home. And um, I think that that's going to uh, mean uh, the 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 whole kitchen and, and cooking category is going to be very strong for for some time. Right. We. We've and Peter, is that, that what you're anticipating as well? I, I mean, is I mean, that 
something that's in the hopper right now? And, yeah, and I, I think there's kind of three pillars, uh, cooking, cleanliness, and health and wellness, or cooking, cleanliness, and wellness. Those are obviously have been very important uh, leading into this pandemic. I think they're in, embedded in kind of how we take care of ourselves. But I think those three pillars will be, will remain strong, uh, or amped up, if you will, uh, after the pandemic clears. There's so many other businesses that will as well. You know, home workplace is getting a real surge right now. Maybe that eases up a bit as everyone equips their homes. Uh, you know, but, but when you look at cooking, cleaning, and wellness, uh, they, will, they, will be, um, they will be around for a while. We're gonna have better cooking skills. We're going to be more aware of how we clean our house, not just mopping brooms and vacuums, but what they do and how they contribute to a much cleaner house. And from a wellness standpoint, always important, especially with, young, with families and with young children, uh, we will be much more aware and sensitive of the surrounding environment and what we can do, again, in that oasis, but what we can do to make sure that oasis is clean, is pure, and contributing to a, a healthier lifestyle. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think that uh, I'm, I'm curious, you brought up home office, and, and for me, it just seems like there's so much... It, industry has had to jump into all of that so quickly that and and it's happened with such alacrity that i wonder how will we go back to spending five days a week you know in an office i mean it's not for me or you warren and you know we we spend our time you know fostering our businesses in a home office but even that you know i mean that maybe maybe tom maybe we won't and and uh, i think i think companies in all sectors not just retailing and housewares uh, are going to learn how to be much more productive remotely through this process. Mm -hmm. And they will realize that if they can sustain or advance that productivity without necessarily committing to significant amounts of office space and the, and the costs associated with that, I think, I think we are in for a, a scenario where there will be more permanent stay-at-home workers uh, in the aftermath of that. And that will contribute going forward to the, the need to kind of continue to evaluate your needs in the home and what, what's good for the home and what's good for you. And again, those are going to be sustainable opportunities for retailers and housewares companies that are connected well to the consumer and can respond to that. Um, do, do, uh, Warren said something that I thought was interesting. I want to ask uh, the other two of you about it. So do you feel that millennials are, uh, uh, I mean, millennials are obviously cooking more. Is that something that you think is going to stick? You know, um, is it, um, I mean, financials alone may, may make that a requisite, but do you think that, um, do you think that that's going to turn into more sales? Do we want to, is that generation looking to um, sort of up, up their, uh, you know, up their use of, uh, I remember after the 2008 recession, we saw a boost in say cookware, for example, and, and higher price cookware, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't at all commensurate with what the, the losses were. Uh, especially among Gen X. So, and, and the, the, when we finally dug into it, we found out, well, these people are cooking at home more often. So they want, they don't want just the junk anymore. They want a real set of cookware and they're willing to make the investment. It's the offset to what I have to do. Do you feel like we'll be seeing some of that with the millennials or, or, you know, is there, or, or in general, is there going to be more of that again, more cooking at home or is just, is Warren the only one that thinks that? <laughs> well, I would agree. Sure. Yep. Yeah, I would. I think it goes back to what you were asking before about habits that are going to be um, based and start in this time and then stay put. I think more people will be cooking from home um, because they'll have developed the skill. I mean, I think initially people are, when people are able to go out, you know, they'll be happy to eat mm -hmm. out for a change, but I don't think they're going to lose those skills. I think that the generation behind the millennials has already shown an interest in, in learning, you know, developing right. cooking skills. So I think you'll definitely see more people cooking, cooking at home. It's interesting. Now it's, now it feels like a survival skill almost, you know, it doesn't just feel like I'm learning to cook. It feels like something, wow, this happens again. I, I got to be able to do this. You know, like this time we were lucky in restaurants stayed open for a while, but here in New York, now even they're starting to close because a lot of their staff is, is getting sick, you know, and, and, uh, you know, but but it's I, I think I think that's one of the things we're going to keep. I hope. You know, it's good yeah, at, at any given time, different things are motivating. Whether it's survival now or whether it was economics, uh, the need to save a few bucks on going out to dinner and learning how to cook at home, or whether if it becomes how to enter, learning how to entertain at home. I think the the generation, the millennial generation, or whomever, 
may have been reluctant early on because a they were living in a home and didn't have to worry about it didn't have families they're, they're you know the oldest millennials are now 40 years old i mean they've got homes yeah. they've got families and uh so these skills that were sort of unnecessary become somewhat more necessary and as you embrace those uh, as allison said they stay those skills stay with you and i i think those are long-term themes that that uh, show the evolution of gener. We're starting to see how generations evolve from that first stage to the second stage to the third stage, and how that changes the behavior in the absence of a pandemic. While well, these things may be uh, doing, all, kind of putting all of that behavior and that behavioral change on steroids, if you will, it's, it's just more intense than ever. Well, I think also it really uh, uh, something that we've been talking about for the you know for the uh, state of the state of the industry address um, at uh, the Houseware Show. I think it ups the ante on some of the things that were requisite for home and housewares. Is things have got to be time saving, you know. Things have got to be space saving, you know, because those when you're when you're getting more of it and you're still, you know, you're you're living in a small environment still, you have to you have to consider those things. So I think some of the some of the old still applies, you know, some standards still still apply. Um, so l let me ask you something. Um, do you feel that manufacturers and retailers right now are, how do I put it? <clears throat> Are they, are they sort of thinking in terms of fear or in ter terms of futures yeah, or both? But, you know, you, you hear from everybody. So is the general feeling right now just, it, frankly, just, is it fear or is it got to move past this? Or is it, you know, what's the feeling when people talk to you? Is it, you know, what's the, the overriding sentiment? Is that for me, Tom? It's for all of you. <laughs> okay, well, I'll give it a shot. I think, you know, as every week goes by, this changes. That's what makes this interesting. From the time we did our first panel on this uh, early in the week to now, maybe there's been a, a dramatic change in the perspective. I think as we go through it, the perspective moves from kind of uh, almost, uh, you know, wait and see, I'm afraid to do anything now because I don't know where it's going to be to the point where you have to start thinking about what that future will be and how am I going to be ready for it. I, I recently wrote that, this is actually a time not to I'm going to ask you about that. I'm going to ask you about okay. that. So, you want me to I go with it now? For you. Um, oh, okay. I'm gonna, I have a specific question for you about that. So let's, yeah. let's hold on that for a minute. But, okay, um, that's fine. Well, let, me, let me rephrase the question. I feel like I'm seeing certain industries go after this as the, uh, I hate to say this, but it's the truth. Some industries are going after this as the opportunity is fear. Okay. Fear factors always played, an, uh, it's always played a role oh, in, 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 in our industry. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm humidifying because it helps me oxygenate my blood better. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm ionizing because it gets all those impurities out of the air. I, it's, but, you know, it's like my mother lived to 92 and she never had a, a humidifier. You know, so it's like we, uh, our industry thrives on a certain degree of, um, of fear factor, I guess. And now I'm seeing like certain industries, like for example, uh, seasonal, okay. Um, when we look at seasonal, we were talking to some of the, the influencers in there they're taking a very heel approach. You know, it's, it's all about like, they're about the future. We've got to look beyond this. You know, the next holiday is going to be about healing and it's going to be about unity and it's going to be about rejuvenating and this and that. And there, there are some people who I'm hearing, okay, it's very sort of the opportunity seems to be in, um, I don't want to say capitalizing on people's fear, but on protectionist types of product, things that protect, protect, protect. So are, are you getting a feeling one way or the other? I, I know it's a difficult question, but are you getting a feeling one way or the other, whether the industry is sort of moving towards products that um, rejuvenate versus products that protect or anything like that? You know, I think no. the industry, at, the, at least in the beginning, is following the consumer's lead you know, if you listen to NPD reports, you know, the initial um, surge in sales was obviously in home office equipment and surprisingly patios. Um, then it moved to, as you mentioned, air purifiers and water purifiers that that would um, tap into what you're talking about, about safety and, and feeling protected. But I think as the weeks go on, you know, now your people are kind of settling in for the long term and you're seeing um, you know, rise in things like crafting and DIY and, and, you know, what can we do at home with our families? So I think for now, the consumer is, is sort of needing and the companies, you know, the companies that make those products are, have benefited, um, which is not to say that the manufacturers are just sitting back. It just means that, you know, it's a constantly evolving um, 
situation. That's Thanks, hard. Elizabeth. You're much less skeptical now, listen to you. <laughs> um, Peter, you agree? Yeah, I, I, I think the consumer is leading, and I think long-term the consumer is going to continue to lead, uh, and it's up to retailers, suppliers to, to, pay, to pay as much attention to it as possible. But I, I do believe that, first of all, the housewares industry or the home products industry has often found opportunity in misfortune, whether it's, you know, water in Flint, Michigan, driving a resurgence of uh, water filtration, or whether it's you know, a hurricane making people want to have uh, more emergency preparedness products, whatever it might be. So there is a opportunity here to be sensitive to the situation and make sure that you are uh, positioning your product as a real solution to people uh, and the brave brands and the brave companies, I use the word brave in a completely ironic way, I'm, I'm almost meaning it sarcastically, will begin to take more advantage of those opportunities as long as they remain sensitive to the situation. It's just the way business is conducted. And, and oh, of course. Uh, it would actually be, I think, counterproductive for companies to be sort of bashful now about letting the world know or letting their customers know how they provide products that also provide service at this time. Socialism has to thrive. It has to move forward. Uh, we can't continue to be altruistic. It doesn't work for business in the long no, term, absolutely. but we can be altruistic it's, it's, now, provide services now, and then and balance that against uh, all, the ultimate goal, which to, is to sell and market your product. But I think you brought up a really good point, and that is that sensitivity and humanity has got to be at the core of it because people, yeah. people are watching that right now. Um, Warren, I'm going to yeah. jump to you for a second because if there's anybody who has, who has a great sensitivity to this, it's you. Um, so who's, who's coming across right now as just like, um, hmm. out of sync. Who's, who's coming across as, as, as really sort of tone deaf? Uh, because I know that I, I'm perceiving a lot of it, like with different ads and things, like take that ad down. But like, what, what's your perception on that? I think uh, companies, whether they're retailers or suppliers, and the retailers are obviously on the front line with consumers, are uh, taking one of several approaches. Uh, uh, a lot of it is uh, we're all in this together and we're here for you. And um, we, we saw that in, uh, during the early stages of, of this crisis. And most of it was pretty disingenuous. It, it really I, it didn't mean anything. And, and I don't think, that, I think after the third or fourth message from a company, uh, most of us said, all right, uh, thank you very much. But uh, if I call up uh, this store and say, I can't pay my credit card bill this month, are you really there for me? So uh, you're certainly seeing some of that. And then you're seeing a lot of companies, uh, a lot of retailers who are saying, um, you know, we know you don't have any, any money and, and you don't have a job and you're stuck at home, but hey, we've got this great toaster oven on sale this, uh, this week and why don't you buy it? And yeah. uh, I think companies are allowed to, to, to sell and, to, and they certainly probably have more inventory than they know what to do with. And they certainly want some money, some, some income and cash, but there's a way to do it. And a lot of the players are not doing it it and finally you've got some some retailers that that are just totally tone deaf and i don't think have uh are, are showing up they're they're running their their programmed uh, promotions and merchandising that was uh, mapped out last uh, last october and uh and to me those are the those are the ones that are the most uh egregious in terms of of just being so out of sync and i think I think uh, shoppers are going to remember some of this when, when when they come back and start buying stuff again. I think tone is, tone is really everything in some of this that you're seeing. It's it's Warren's, port, it's Warren's point, Tom, if I might, Warren's point, right, is that there, there is a, there's a responsibility to, to not be tone deaf to it. And I, and what's important, if you go back before this, uh, younger consumers especially have been really associating themselves and identifying themselves with companies that demonstrate social responsibility. Uh, and, and and this is actually an opportunity for brands to kind of rebuild their identity uh, and to craft an identity that means 
something more than just the bells and whistles of their products because there is a consumer base that is already predisposed and maybe it's wider than we know to supporting businesses and brands that are socially responsible so it'll be interesting to see how brands kind of take the opportunity to almost recraft their brand identity or just continue to build their brand identity in that context well i think it's interesting i was talking to allison earlier in the week because um the last webinar one of the things that i had said just sort of in context it made sense but just as a throw off i said um is it you know is it time for retailers to take a greater role in helping us be um helping us through this, helping us through this by just asking for less, you know, changing markup structures or changing their margin structures or, you know, uh, or altering their model somewhat. And um, I got to tell you, I got so many people, so many viewers emailing me about that saying it is time. It is time because this, this industry, you know, the re retailers live with a set, you know, it's like, they have they have margin plans like anybody else, but is it time to re-explore that in what is going to be a, a really it's going to be a pressing environment. You know, when you look at, um, uh, you know, some of the figures that just came out today uh, about, uh, you know, small businesses, especially businesses under two, under $20 million, they're, they're really going to be crippled by this. You know, they've already over 50% of them have already let people go, uh, you know, and uh, so it's, the numbers are really hard for very small business and for, you know, small town business. And that has, that has an emotional effect, you know, so it, uh, it's just, um, it's going to be interesting sort of all in to see when this is over, you know, if you're not going to stand by, we're here for you, Les Warren said, you're not going to stand by it all the way through, like not just in the rough part, you know, it's, it's going to send a message to some very highly influenced generations that you're really not there for us, you know, so it's just sort of like, be careful what you say these days, because uh, um, Allison, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you, do you, uh, do you agree? Um, yeah, I would. And um, I think it is an opportunity for retailers and brands to, you know, make it clear what they stand for. I'm going to put in a pitch. I always, I've said before, I, um, I love the Sam's Club ad that just says, thank you. It's really touching. Um, you know, and they, from what I understand, they don't advertise ordinarily. So, you know, um, yeah, I think it is a good opportunity. Yeah, it was interesting to see them advertise. I thought that was really, you're right, they don't usually advertise. So it was, it was really, and it was very, it was really heartwarming. And I'm, this is a hard heart to warm. <laughs> um, so Peter, you said something in an editorial this week, and I was determined I was going to ask you about it because um, it was your usual bright incendiary statement. Um, but uh, you said, this is a moment for business, to, for businesses to do everything within their fiscal, operational, and compassionate responsibilities to resist strategic paralysis, which can lead to tactical atrophy. Now, if I take the words out that I had to look up, do you want to do you want to paraphrase? Yeah, you just used it, so I, we're we're even right now. So yeah. <laughs> um, that, look, that, I was gonna as I was gonna I say earlier, this thing. kind of ties into this ties into whether you're in business or in life. I mean, it's, it's amazing what we learn of the parallels between kind of living and, and working when we, uh, when we go through something like this. And, and my point was, and is, while managing cash flow and, and, and kind of standing pat and sort of waiting to see where it all falls is kind of a natural instinct. Uh, it is a protectionist instinct. That's just the way it is. Um, it's actually a time both in business and in life, and especially in the context of business, where you can't just stop doing what you do. If you're a creative organization, you still have to think and, and prepare creatively. Uh, if you're a sales organization, as difficult as it is right now, you have to continue to develop sales programs and think about the things we were just talking about, how to connect with people moving forward, and that's on the marketing side too. So my point is, we if we wait, and see it may be too late for us because you have to avoid that kind of strategic paralysis. You have to continue to do and perform your jobs as you are outlined to do. Obviously with a stronger emphasis on getting through this crisis now, that, that near term, but if you don't use those muscles, if you don't think and create, and if you don't lose the, use those muscles, you're gonna lose those muscles. And by the time it's, it, everyone's ready to kind of sort of move on, you might be left behind. So, so now the harder question, and you don't have to name names, but when you write something like that, my first thought is he's, he's watching the market and he's seeing people who are not moving. 
or was it just a general statement that you believe in? Or do you see? I, I, I can tell. I, I I can and won't, but won't tell you who I may or may not be speaking directly about because right. it's it may not be in my interest to do that right now. I think it's a there is a generalization there though that's a message for everyone whether they are doing that or aren't. Um, I, you have to be reminded that this is a time to, to try to move forward. We are focused on the near term, and that makes a lot of sense. As I said earlier, as we get a little further into this, we start to think more about how we're going to make it to the long term. We don't know when the long term is going to begin, and that's the hard part. We, we can't really predict that and what, what it will look like. But you ha And you have to adapt. doesn't mean you should be doing the yeah, same you things you can't stop moving. Fine, but you have you can't stop moving. So it's, it is more of a general statement. But there are certain retailers, and the, my fellow panelists know who they might be, and I'm sure the people who are watching this uh, know who that might be. They're either, they either didn't move fast enough and they, or they moved too late. Uh, and um, through no fault of their own, this, this situation will only exacerbate some of that. Uh, and it may be very, very difficult for them when, when this uh, emerges. And that's not just retailers, brands and companies as well, too. Oh, no, of course. Um, so uh, let me ask the other two of you. Um, you have, if, if, do you have any sort of broad statement that you want to make? If you could take the industry by the shoulders and say this, you know, what you live with the industry at, like I said, at 30,000 feet, you see, you see um, manufacturers, retailers, importers, every kind of supplier that there is and provider, people who deal with the end consumer, people who don't, you are in it deep on every level. If you could, you know, so Peter's delivered his message. Um, if you had a, a message to deliver, what would it be? Warren, what's important for people to be thinking right now? You know, I was on uh, another webinar earlier today, one of the 47 that I think we've all been on this week, uh, <laughs> the way that we communicate with each other. And it was, it was Mark Cuban from um, Shark Tank and, and from a few other places. If you're a basketball fan, you know him well. Um, and and, and he, just had, he just had a very simple, great message. You know, he said, um, he said, the, uh, for businesses, this is a time to connect, not a time to sell. And, and, and I think that really just sums it up so well of, of, of how companies should be handling things right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and any company that's not sticking to that mantra, I think, is, is missing the point. Uh, I think longer term, and I think that the, the forecast that all of us could agree on and that virtually everybody does is that, is that uh, online retailing is going to gain an enormous amount of market share. And if you're a company that does not have your online act together and is not doing e-com correctly, I think you're in a whole lot of trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I look at, uh, uh, you know, I think um, we talked about uh, about TJ Maxx and, and, and those guys before, and there's going to be a feeding frenzy of merchandise for these guys to sell. Uh, uh, home particularly uh, in the short term. But uh, th th these guys are getting, you know, less than 1% of their business from online. And they, they need to find a way to, to grow that. Uh, I look at Burlington stores, which uh, in uh, right before all of this started, said, um, we're going to eliminate our online business. It, it's 0.5% of our business. It's not consistent with our physical model. And, and I think that's just, I think that was one of the dumbest decisions I've ever heard a, a, a company make. Uh, and they've got to be- see if there's an about face on that. Yeah, they've got to be regretting it. Uh, uh, you know, there is a way for those off-price guys to make online work. You know, if, if, if Rent the Runway can, can coordinate their online inventories and their physical store inventories, there's no reason why TJX and Ross can't do it. So. Um, I think long term, and 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 this is for independent retailers too. I know uh, it, it it's a hard model for for specialty retailers to get, but whatever it takes, it's yeah. it's like paying your electricity and and painting the front of the store. This yeah. is this is it's a gotta no pay. longer a luxury. I I agree with you, especially I mean when yep. you look at, at small businesses, it's 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 a must. We got to figure out a way. You know, there's got to be a way. Yeah. Um, Allison, yep. thoughts? 
Well, I pretty much think that Peter and Warren said it all and summed it up well. Um, the only thing I would add is a, is a comment that I read the other day. It's time to imagine the unimaginable and mm -hmm. to keep an open mind and to um, business is not going to be the same. You have to be creative. I think, you know, it's funny, I think uh, what Warren said about, about um, connections, you know, and, and this is a great time for me to say thank you to you guys, because um, one of the things that we've been able to do, and I, I didn't even think I thought it was particularly strange at the time, but to bring together the three of you who normally, I mean, boxing gloves are needed, or at least some sort of body armor. Nah, uh, I like these guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's just great that you're all sitting around a table, you know, and you're not competitors. We're all just focused on delivering information that's going to help people get through this or, you know, get through the aftermath. And I so appreciate it. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've got the markets coming in in about 10 days, the, uh, the major markets are going to come in and talk about the same thing. And these are people who don't, I'm not saying they're, sh they're sharing strategy, but they're sharing realities and, and getting ideas from each other and giving ideas to manufacturers and retailers and ex exhibitors. And it's just, it's really heartwarming to see, you know, to, to just see people connecting in a way that is just has the best, um, the best interest of the industry in mind. No suspicion, just like, what do we know? You know, and we all, really we all benefit if the industry does, comes out of this well. Yep. So if there's any time for competitors, not just in the business media, but in the housewares and on retailing side to sort of figure out a way, you know, not to avoid each other when they're kind of figuratively walking down the street right now and maybe come together do a fist bump and figure out what they can do together to get through this right. together. They all will benefit in the long run or should yeah. benefit in the long run. It's and a, it's a and I think it has, has to be an elbow bump, uh, Peter. <laughs> oh, is that what we're up to right now? Okay. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if I mentioned this before. I, I came across a picture, Allison, I have to send it to you of us in Las Vegas. Not that one. Um, but uh, <laughs> there's a picture of us with, um, Patty Carpenter and Michelle and we were all at dinner and I ordered this milkshake and we were all like, had our faces in it, you know, and yeah, I thought, with Leanne who, would too. thought yeah. who would have thought like, you know, we need six foot straws now. <laughs> it's I like, know. It's crazy, but well, it, uh, not plastic though. They have to be uh, reusable. No, or paper, no. so. Absolutely paper, you know, paper with biodegradable wax, uh, you know, centers. Um, so uh, let's see, I, I, I had other questions I wanted to ask. Um, Oh, I know a question I wanted to ask. So, did you guys make your beds today? I make my bed every night. My bed is made, but I didn't make it. So let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Warren? I make it every day. Awesome. I make my bed every day. <laughs> all godforsaken liars. The only one who told the truth about that was Peter. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You want me to take this camera upstairs? I'll show you the main plan, all right? <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, then I'll believe you. I just, um, I, somebody asked me that today, and I was like, no. Uh, <laughs> I was like, uh, no, not really. Um, so, Allison, how, how, is, how has being an editor-in-chief changed for you since this whole thing started? What's, what's different now about your day? Than it was aside from working at home all the time which you know has its own challenges but right um well you know our, we we consider our our mission is to provide news and features and analysis so we're always um our goal is to give people information and to tell them what they need to know what they want to know but what they need to know and people are desperate for information right now so and it's our job to give it um, and to give it context so on a normal basis, you know, we're balancing our, um, our online reporting with our um, print preparation. But recently, you know, our focus has been much more on the digital aspect. It's been much more focused on the news that keeps pouring in. And so we have to keep pivoting, just like any other business. You know, we just, you know, we'll have a, a lineup um, for the next print issue that Andrew and I have to completely tear up and throw out and start again and then start again because the news just keeps changing. So that's been a challenge. I mean, that's our job. That's what we do. That's what we're expected to do, but it's just been accelerated. So I look forward to going back to a little bit more balance, a little bit uh, opportunity to dig deeper into things instead of, you know, the news just keeps coming and coming. So, yeah. um, yeah. And, uh, 
Warren, change, what's changed in the way, you know, in the way you're doing business, in the, in the things that you're being asked to write or to contribute on? How's that changed? Well, again, I joked about uh, all of us being on, on a lot of webinars and, uh, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that most of us had, uh, if we had ever, uh, uh, if we had ever heard of Zoom before two weeks ago, uh, it was probably a pretty uh, rudimentary understanding of what it was. Um, you know, when somebody first mentioned Zoom, I thought they were talking about Zumba and and. and <laughs> I thought they were talking about that old <laughs> PBS television show. Yes. Or whatever. Oh. <laughs> I remember yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So we've certainly, you know, we've certainly adapted to this and I think it's great. It's, uh, it's, it's technology that didn't exist the last time uh, we were sort of in a crisis mode and it's, you know, it makes things better. Uh, right now as an editor and a writer, all anybody wants to talk about and read about is, is, uh, is coronavirus and, uh, if uh, if if you're writing a story and it doesn't have the word coronavirus in the headline, people are probably going to keep scrolling through it. So Thank I'm you. hoping, like Allison is, we get to the point where maybe uh, one out of every ten stories can be about something else, and uh, yeah, maybe two out of every ten stories. But for right now, th that's all, and I'm I'm as guilty of that as anybody. I well, I mean, I, I think we all are. Even even from a trend perspective, it's like you know. Every report starts with, you know, in a world where it's, you know, it's that sort of like, you know, what, we were just working on a seasonal report today and it's like, you know, um, you know, seasonal after COVID, you know, and you're actually starting report names with that because people need to know that you've adapted your reporting for this new world, you know, so it's, so for me, it's like, you know, you're projecting out. And all of a sudden, it's like Allison said, you finish something and you're like, oh, got to reel that in. You know, we just yeah. took uh, Art Deco out of a report because it's like Deco's not appropriate anymore. It's too rich. It's too opulent. It's not where people's heads are going to be after this is over. You know, so did it matter that it took us like, you know, a month to put it together? You know, but it's, it's you know, and so you kind of have to mention it so people know that you're on the ball. But at the same time, it's like, please, can I name something that does not have this in the title? Um, Peter, what about you? You know, well, first of all, I, one of the things I agree with Alice, it's very hard uh, if you're in a sort of frequency-based uh, print magazine, whether it's every other week or every month or whatever it might be. It's, it, when, when you have a fluid development like uh, COVID uh, and you're trying to prepare to, to put some sort of analysis or story together today, knowing that the magazine won't be out until uh, maybe three, four, five days later, it, it is so hard now to prepare for that that print side. At the end of the day though, if we didn't have the digital side, we'd have to figure out how to do that. The digital side has allowed all media outlets, B2B, B2C, all of them, to sort of stay on top of yeah. the developments and add layers to our digital content that we might not have done before, might have waited till we can put it into the magazine. So it's changing media, changing our business. Uh, but one thing that's really different now, and it's always been there for me a little bit because I'm not just a day-to-day -day reporter in the business. I'm known as having a, an opinion on the business, but I think reporters in general are asked for to be counselors now more so than they might have been. Uh, they don't just want information; they want direction. They they want yeah. someone to make them feel better about what's going on, or they at least they they let me bounce an idea off you. What do you think? Right. So they're looking for um, sort of that third-party kind of expert, quote-unquote expert. Mm -hmm guidance right. and counsel because they're afraid right now. Or they, and, and the problem is, as Allison again mentioned, we just don't know all the answers. I'm not sure we ever have all the answers, <laughs> uh, even though we might think we do. Uh, but this one's real hard when it comes to counseling people. Yeah. So well, I say- You're not just one of 10 opinions. You're the only, you're like the most educated opinion. You're We are all in the business of actually helping people make business decisions through our content. Uh, this is a time when they're actually really looking for us to help them make decisions. And it's a, you know, it's an interesting place to be. It's a high level of responsibility. Media, the media really does hold that accountability right now uh, in, in all facets. Um, but it's, and I feel bad when I tell people, you know, here's sort of what I think, but you know, I'm not sure you want to necessarily go to the bank on that right now because it could change tomorrow. Yeah, it's true. Um, so I think that uh, one of the things that I really wanted to ask you all about was the idea of the, the modern market. So it's going to be the next part of this, of this webinar series, but I'm curious in advance, what, what's the next, if it, if, if we peak today, if we hit the apex today, 
things started normalizing again. Let's just assume that. Um, if we assume that, what does the next market, what does the modern market look like? Is it, are we gonna see a, a, a significant increase in uh, virtual markets and digital markets? Uh, you know, are we going to, uh, you know, do you hear on the Vine uh, manufacturers um, and suppliers, you know, looking into that sort of thing? Uh, or, you know, what are you hearing? Well, I think, you know, before this all started, as you all know, um, some of the market operators had already taken steps towards a digital marketplace. You know, IMC has invested $100 million in doing so for its three major markets. Um, uh, Vesa Frankfurt has done likewise. Other markets have not taken that step yet. But um, I think this crisis that we're in just highlights the need for that. I think that's an obvious thing. I think the future will be a blend of online and um, traditional meeting meeting spots. Uh, it's it's going to have to be. I think people will be glad to see one another in person, but I think there's got to be a need, again, for a digital platform. Uh, Peter, thoughts? Well, I think the balance is, is, I agree with Allison, there has to be a balance and there's going to be changes and there's going to be a lot of discussions in the industry about whether or not we need to support a, a B2B marketplace the way we did in the past. And so it's incumbent on the B2B marketplaces, uh, the shows, if you will, not to be solely focused on the three or four or five days of their show. They need to culminate and build toward that, but they have to stay connected with and offer services with their constituency throughout the year. And many of the markets have already begun developing such strategies this is now obviously accelerating and intensifying the need for them to do that um we are we crave uh face to face we don't often think about it but we crave face to face business and nuance in business is much better served uh in a face to face marketplace um and and it is also a place where you can kind of see the vista of a particular category or segment all, all in one shot. So a balance is necessary, much better connection through the year using digital uh, media is going to be important. Um, yet I think a well-placed B2B marketplace can su survive and thrive going forward if they satisfy all the needs of their constituents. Just like the industry has to listen to the consumers, the marketplaces have to listen to the vendors and the retailers. Yeah, I, I, and I mean, I'm, I'm a slave to context. I, I, I think when people shop a market, if you can't see everything that's out there, you're just, you feel like you're buying what's been pushed at you, you know, and, and, to, and to not be able to walk a hall, you know, it's just, uh, but what's really interesting to me, uh, and then Warren, I'd like your opinion on it, but what's interesting to me is you talk about people who just don't have their ear to the ground. I'm talking to like all markets and I'm not naming names either, but there are some markets that when I say to them, well, it's, it's not just about the virtual marketplace. Don't forget, we're entering a new economy where buyers and many buyers and retailers are not going to have the, the where with the financial wherewithal to attend every show the way they used to, you know, so and you hear this silence and it's something that it's not about the laws of attraction alone. It's about the, the ability to, you know, stores used to go to so many shows and, and, you know, and the concentration wasn't on whether it was regional or what the expense was, the concentration was on which was the best show. Now we have another thing to take into account, which is whether or not they're affordable. Um, you know, they can afford to do that or how many people can go, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's that too. How much can we pack into a two day show instead of a four day show, you know, things like that. Um, Warren, any thoughts on, on the marketplace of the future? Yeah, I think in the last decade, we've already seen this winnowing down of the number of important markets and shows, and uh, each product segment really is, is increasingly focused on one and maybe two shows uh, on a national basis. So part of this is just the process of what we've gone through. And there may be a little bit more of a shakeout. There's, you know, there's not a lot of uh, major shows left. So um, it's a question of, of, of whether they're all going to make it. And, you know, you could, you might be able to make an argument that one or two won't, but I think most of the shows that are there will. Um, mm -hmm. This just reminds me of the conversation that we had uh, uh, in uh, after 9-11 about uh, uh, at the at the B2C level, you know, uh, if if people were concerned with their safety, were they going to still go to malls, uh, which could be terrorist uh, um, 
locations and uh, uh, were they going to ever buy products online? And, you know, and at that point it was, uh, it was books and CDs and people said, Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. you know, you'll never sell mattresses and refrigerators and, and shoes and, uh, and in general, yes. automobiles online. And, and we know how that worked out. So mm -hmm. any of the people who were saying, uh, online will never gain a foothold in the B2B process, I think are just, uh, are just not, uh, are, are just not thinking it through. And it's going to be there. But as Peter said, and Allison, it's going to be a blend, a blended strategy. So the shows will be important. But, but, uh, but they need to, uh, again, as, as has been said, they need to um, take on a, a, a somewhat different role. Uh, Makes you wonder if, if one of the answers might not be, you know, what Hong Kong and, and uh, Guangzhou did, which is create mega shows where buyers yeah. go to a single location for, a, you know, cross category. And plus, there's so much category creep anyway, <laughs> that it might actually do more for our business than less to have people looking at categories that they're not usually, you know, they're not used to looking at. Um, but I just uh, need to move the show to Maui. That's all. If there's only one oh, show. I'm in. I am in. <laughs> it should be a 12-day show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, I think that's about all the time we have, but I want to thank you all again so much for opening up, for telling us what you know. Um, and uh, to our audience, if you have any questions for um, uh, any of the people here today, please feel free to email it to us at info at springboardfutures.com, and we will pass your questions on and get answers for you. In the interim, um, thank you so much. Keep an eye on us, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 See you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.